Warhammer 40k Darktide on the PC is something I've been looking forward to cover for quite some time. I love the Warhammer 40k universe and Darktide is made with unique engine technology, no Unreal or Unity here, and that is something I always want to highlight and celebrate on the channel. So in today's video, I will talk about Warhammer 40k Darktide, what it is, how it plays, what interesting graphical techniques power this vision of the 41st millennium, and I will of course go over optimized settings for mid-range PCs as performance is rather important for a title like this. So what kind of title is this, you may ask? Well, Warhammer 40k Darktide is a first-person co-op game where you make a character from four choosable classes, customize them to your liking, and embark on various missions with three other players. You complete objectives in dark, dystopian environments, and after missions, you can gear up and add to your character's abilities. For example, I chose to primarily play as a psyker, using psychic abilities in combat, being able to one-shot enemies by blowing up their brains, or infusing my weapons with warp stuff to siphon out enemy souls. But there's a catch as a psyker. I use too many powers too quickly, and I end up suffering from perils of the warp. I hear voices, I go insane, and I essentially die, killing myself. Where is the Medicaid? So the game can be pretty brutal, and that's one thing I learned very quickly, is that you cannot just spam attacks or fight by your lonesome in this game. As if you do, you'll probably die really quickly as enemies are aggressive and they deal a lot of damage when you are hit. The basic gameplay though is very fluid as you're often switching between melee, ranged weapons, and special abilities while trying to survive. I would say that it plays like a mix of chivalry, Left 4 Dead, and Diablo. So if that sounds like fun, then this is the game for you. Backing up all the action and amplifying it is an incredibly evocative soundtrack by Jesper Kidd. And let me tell you, this soundtrack really goes places. In one scene, you can be killing heretics to backing music that is primarily organ-driven melodies. Or you can face down bosses with some of the nastiest industrial sounds this side of the Cicatrix Maledictum. When your weapon fire mixes with the character barks and the music is hitting its height, the feeling that is communicated is incredible, and it is all heightened by the great craftsmanship that makes up this game's visuals. The visuals here are driven by Fat Shark's very own branch of Autodesk's Stingray engine as far as I can tell, and there is a cornucopia of modern rendering techniques here to create one of the most authentic looking renditions of Warhammer 40k that I've seen to date. First let's start with some of the small details that immediately caught my eye. To render the various surfaces found in this grimdark feature, Fat Shark has elected to extensively use parallax mapping to do the micro detail found on the industrial surfaces in this game. So on metal or stone, there's usually not that much real geometric detail, rather parallax mapped trims are instead used to fill them out with bumpy effect. So nearly all of the bolts, rivets, screws, divots, stampings, and more are made using this texturing effect and it's used everywhere. It's hard to find a surface that doesn't have parallax maps on them. This is a smart move performance wise as it typically shifts the rendering load on to a different part of the GPU and geometry performance could instead be spent elsewhere. For example, like enabling large detail environments at a distance, which this game definitely has. There are massive manufactorum chambers, halls filled with giant statues, underhive wastes, and abandoned desert towns that remind me a lot of Killzone 2, oddly enough. There's a surprising amount of variety in the environments here, and the game definitely does not skimp on the large, oppressive gothic architecture that this universe is known for. Based upon the missions I've played so far, Fat Shark absolutely nailed the environmental design and atmosphere here in Dark Tide, both figuratively and literally. 
literally as lit volumetric fog drives the core look of a lot of these environments, with that smoggy, dusty look that you can see straight out of Warhammer 40k concept artwork. Backing up this fog is a decoupled system for lighting and shadowing particle effects, much like you have seen in Alien Isolation back in the day, that definitely increases the fidelity of particle effects like smoke. While on the subject of lighting, one thing that I found particularly great was the emphasis on real-time lighting and shadowing just found on your character itself. For example, your character has a shoulder lamp in first person which weakly lights the area ahead of you and casts shadows. Depending upon your weapon, like the auto gun here, you can also have an optional flashlight which also casts shadows. Then your gunfire's muzzle flashes also cast shadows. So there are three shadow casting lights just on your player model, and that's not including all the other lighting in the environment, and how your friends and foes also cast light and shadow as well. As silly as it sounds, this extensive usage of real-time shadowing for so many light sources makes firefights in the dark environments that this game have that much more tense, as you are actively using light as another resource often enough to just try and survive. The cohesive glue behind all this real-time lighting in Darktide is an implementation of ray trace reflections and RTXGI, which is a probe-based ray trace global illumination system that does not offer the fine-grained granularity of a per-pixel RTGI, but still allows for convincing real-time bounce lighting on a larger scale. Both ray tracing effects together add a lot to any single scene, and it tends to look like this. In this scene from the prologue, I have RT off right now. If I turn on ray trace reflections to high, you can see it adds in a lot of reflections that just weren't there before with plain old screen space reflections. If we look, we can see very coherent reflections like those from standing pools of water are being added in, as well as very rough reflections like those found on the scuffed up metal of the floor, which now has a different look entirely. Now let's take this image with ray trace reflections and add an RTX GI on top. As we can see, RTX GI further increases the scene realism, where the bounce light from dynamic sources is added in. The flame on the left hand side of the screen for example now also casts bounce light in the environment around it, giving the entire scene more of an ambient orange glow. And if we look at the area above these two red hazard lights here, we can also see that there's more red glow in the image as well with that RTX GI on. When playing campaign missions, it can be interesting to see the effects of dynamic GI and real-time reflections in action. For one, you can shoot out a number of lights in the game world just to see how the lighting changes in real time. And sometimes you can also see areas of the game world where lighting changes rapidly due to mission events. For example here, the scene is generally Really dark, but then a big floodlight turns on as waves of enemies were going to start approaching my squad. If we look at that in slow motion, we can see how the entire area, which is only indirectly lit, is now partially lit by white bounce light at the mouth of the warehouse opening when that floodlight turns on. That is only happening here due to RTXGI and those RT reflections being added in. So yeah, I would say Warhammer 40k Darktide is a really impressive graphical showcase. But still, not everything's perfect graphically and there are some rough edges. The most obvious rough edge I can see is in the quality of volumetric fog at a distance. Volumetric fog, even at the highest settings in the game, does seem rather chunky at a distance where there's some obvious aliasing and blockiness. Perhaps an even higher setting than the highest would make this scalable for future PCs. Another issue I noticed was how level of detail for geometry is handled in a more obvious way. Often LOD transitions occur like this one here, where there's a rather obvious transition to a lower level of geometry that just pops in with no crossfade between LOD levels. And the lower LODs themselves, in my opinion, seem a bit over deformed or overly spiky often, where the wheel here, for example, I think doesn't look very good below the highest LOD. But even then, those are just two issues and otherwise a very handsome technical package, and it's one of the best looking multiplayer games I've ever played, with an attention to detail and graphical features that definitely rival those found in slow paced single player campaigns. As you might imagine, that amount of graphical prowess will take some taming to run well on mid-range CPUs and GPUs, but before I get into my optimized settings here, I want to briefly touch on stability and performance in general in Darktide. Optimized settings will help, but Darktide itself is going to be a challenging game on many people's CPUs due to the amount of animations and draw calls that need to be processed at any one time 
when, for example, a horde of plague walkers just shows up in the game world. There's only so much scaling we can expect here with optimized settings to hit 60 FPS, as the base game has high requirements just to make the basic gameplay like this even possible. But even with that in mind, I have still come across a number of issues that will affect all PCs in this game. Now, it's really important to stress that the game does not at all suffer from shader compilation stutter in my experience. There is a dedicated pre-compilation step that occurs when the game is loaded up for the first time after a patch or after a driver change where shaders are crunched on for an extended period on the CPU. I'm very thankful the developers thought to put that in. But still, I have encountered hitchy frame drops in Darktide that I think are partially related to moving across the environment and when things are kind of batch loaded in. A good example I can show you is in the game's intro on a very powerful rig. When I go from area to area in the game's intro, trying to hit a V-Sync 60 FPS, we can see obvious hitches and drops when a new room or area is traversed through. In my experience, this happens at any and all graphical settings regardless of how good a PC is, so even on the lowest settings. And I can show that off very well in the game's mission hub. When you run around the command dais here, like I'm showing here on a Core i9-12900K at the lowest settings, you will see frame time issues in action. Take a look at the frame time graph there. Notice how the usual frame time is extremely low due to the 12900K being a beast, but as the camera is rounding around corners and reveals new bits of the game world and things perhaps load in, the frame time increases dramatically for a few frames, often going above 16.6 milliseconds or even above 33.3 milliseconds. This leads to a spiky frame time graph, and visually you see unsmooth animations and general hitchiness to the game when you run through the world. Due to the length of the frame times, you can even see this hitching occurring when trying to lock the game at a 60Hz VSync, or even if you tried to lock the game to 30fps, you would still see these hitches as the frame times can be longer than 33.3 milliseconds, even on massive CPUs like the 12900K that I'm showing here with VSync on. So in general, the game feels kind of hitchy in my experience when you're just running through the game world, regardless of your graphical settings, and this is present throughout all the B-roll I have made, and I would really like to see this fixed. Another issue I have found is that there can be a bit of randomness with performance that doesn't seem very reproducible. The first time I played the Desert Outpost missions, it was a generally pretty great 60 FPS beyond that hitching issue I mentioned earlier. The second time I played it though, the game kept dropping and locking to around 30 FPS during that mission, even though the graphical settings were the exact same. This shows off two issues I think. One is that the game performance can be a bit random, perhaps due to internet or server issues that you have no control of. And it also shows that VSync in Darktide tends to round down performance in a way like double buffered VSync. For example, in this scene here, I'm maxing out the settings at 4K, native resolution with VSync off on the left hand side on the RTX 4090, running a flat out 50 FPS almost with VSync off there. Turning on VSync on the right hand side though, we can see that it rounds down the frames per second to around 40 and just keeps it there. Even though there's a lot of GPU headroom to spare, and we would imagine triple buffered VSync would keep it at around 49 to 50 FPS here. So when you apply VSync to this game, it does some weird frame smoothing behavior. And the last issue I found is not performance related, but there's just a general instability of the game at times. I had at least one game crash and two disconnects for the eight missions I played in full. That is not the worst, but it's also not stable at all. And I can't really tell you why those crashes or disconnects occurred. They just did. Okay, with that being said, let's move on to our optimized settings, which I'm targeting 60 FPS on an RTX 2060 Super coupled with a Ryzen 5 3600. My first bit of advice is to use image reconstruction. Both FSR and DLSS, in my experience, have better anti-aliasing than the game's default TAA. Just look at how both FSR2 and DLSS in performance mode here have much less subpixel popping here versus the native with TAA. So definitely use them. Between FSR2 and DLSS, FSR2 users will see more aliasing in general though due to disocclusion fizzle as I've found. Most often when your gun, sword, or characters reveal the game world behind them, you'll see a fizzle, like here with the muzzle flash. With FSR2, each muzzle flash causes the area near the muzzle flash and the area behind the muzzle flash to fizzle for multiple frames, which your eye picks up. That is the general difference between DLSS and FSR2 in this game. The second obvious optimized setting is to turn off all ray tracing features in spite of how cool they are. On a mid-range GPU like the RTX 2060 Super at 1440p native, turning on RT reflections with no other RT on, for example, in this simple scene here, sees a massive performance cost on low even of 30% 
with high reflections being a bit more expensive than that. We can see a similar thing with RTX GI in this shot here, which has an even larger hit to performance than RT reflections, costing more than 40% of the performance and showing no critical difference in performance between low and high RTX GI. So for mid-range GPUs, I definitely recommend turning it off and definitely for mid-range CPUs as well. If you do want to use RT, I recommend an RTX 3070 or above and a modern i7 or i9 processor or Ryzen 5000 series and above. If you are going to use ray tracing, set both of those to high as RTX GI runs the same as far as I can tell, and the loss to reflection quality on low is very high for the small bits of performance it can offer. So definitely high for both if you want to use it at all. The next setting to optimize is screen space reflections. Here I recommend the medium setting, which saves around 10% performance over high while still showing reflections that are similar enough at a glance as high. After this, another easy win for GPU performance is with ambient occlusion where the low setting, for example, offers a very similar look to every setting above it and will save around 9% performance, so definitely use low there. Then there's the light quality setting, which in most views primarily controls the quality of shadow resolution. Here I find the high setting to be optimized for visuals as medium and low tend to be a bit too aliased for my liking, even if they run a little bit better. The last really important GPU setting is volumetric fog quality. Here going down from the extreme setting, sees notable hits to a volumetric fog quality at a distance till it turns off at low. As I mentioned earlier though, I find extreme quality in this game still to be rather chunky, so I have two recommendations here. If you want pure performance, use medium. But if you are like me and want more quality, use extreme, as we will offset the performance hit in the end by using DLSS or FSR2, which should make its greater cost not too much of a problem in most scenes as I see it. And that is it for meaningful settings tweaks. Other settings like scattered detail density in my experience do not have a market effect on CPU performance like the blog by Fat Shark purports. So I say leave it at 1.0. Same with the lens flare origin setting. The all light setting in my experience seems to perform the same on the CPU as the sunlight setting does. So still the best setting for CPU scaling is the ray tracing like I mentioned earlier. You turn it off unless you have a really good CPU like a later series Intel or Ryzen processor when looking for 60 FPS. Now one setting I've seen people trying to tweak online outside of the game is found in the game launcher if you go to the settings and options there. If you scroll to the very bottom you'll see a value for the amount of worker threads, which presumably tweaks the amount of threads used by the game's multi-threading system. It defaults always to 1 under the max amount, so 9 here on a Ryzen 5 3600 out of a maximum of 10, and the Ryzen 5 3600 of course has 12 threads total. I recommend leaving it at the default value, that is max minus 1. I tested it at three different values, three total workers on the far left, nine total workers in the middle, and 10 total worker threads on the far right. I saw that the values nine and 10 performed essentially the exact same in terms of average frame rate. They were quite literally overall within one tenth of one percentage point of each other. But lowering the amount of worker threads did noticeably decrease performance. At three worker threads on the far left, it was on average 11% slower. And it could be presumably even slower when there's a lot more stuff happening on screen. So I definitely recommend leaving the worker thread setting at its default, which is just one notch below the max. Altogether, my optimized settings look like this. No RT on the mid-range, of course, saving on SSAO and SSR, and spending a bit more on volumetric quality to keep it looking good. In total, optimized settings will save 18% over max settings in a dense scene at native resolution like we're seeing here on the RTX 2060 Super, and with using DLSS on top of that in the balanced mode at 4040p, which I recommend, saves 97% over that unoptimized native presentation. And with that, I've come to the end of this video. I just want to reiterate at the end that this is one of the best realized versions of 40k I've ever seen put into video games visually, and it's very technically accomplished. Currently though, it has some performance that is hard to wrap your head around. I really would like to see the frame time issues cleared up, no matter what their origin may be, as it's really hard to tell where it's coming from. And of course, I would like to see no crashing and disconnecting at all as well. But that is really all I have to say for this game at the moment. If you did like this video, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to help us out, support DF on Patreon to get years of our content in high quality for download. Other than that, comment below, follow on Twitter, and as always, this is Alex, bring you farewell, and auf Wiedersehen!